So, uh, what's going on here? Um, more shitty news. So I'm going to, I was sick yesterday, took a day off. I, uh, put post that on Twitter and on, on YouTube, uh, the community tab. I started to feel, I felt fine this morning, started to feel a little sick again. So I want to make sure I covered this live just in case I was too, uh, in case I got, you know, sick again today before being able to cover this. So this just broke. Let me go down here, go through this garbage. All right. <clears throat> so I got a couple of videos coming up um, and what needs to be done over, you know, what's been going on. So this story just broke. Uh, this is the, the final day of, of rulings from the Supreme Court. So this is the last day of destruction, uh, at least, you know, in the, in the short term. The Supreme Court sharply curtails the authority of the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. In a 6-3 ruling, the court sides with conservative states and fossil fuel companies in adopting a narrow reading of the Clean Air Act. So, um, here is that decision. Of course, I'm not going to read through, you know, 90 pages here, but uh, I'll give you a short summary um, from both The Hill and uh, NPR. But first, so this was already expected to go down. Um, it was just a matter of, I guess, how severe the ruling was going to be. But here is uh, Ali Mistal on a C-SPAN earlier this week discussing this ruling that he saw coming. The biggest one that I'm still waiting for is when the conservatives on the Supreme Court revoke essentially the Clean Air Act um, and uh, uh, destroy the administrative state. The case is called West Virginia versus EPA. It's about whether or not the EPA has the authority to regulate the air under the Clean Air Act. And what I fear six conservatives, and mainly Neil Gorsuch, will say is that the EPA doesn't have that authority. And in fact, courts, not the um, executive agencies, not the professionals, not the experts, have the right to decide how much pollution is allowed in our air. Um, and that's going to be very bad. That's going to be, that to me was always going to be the second worst decision um, from the Supreme Court this term behind Dobbs. All right. There you go. So that's what has now gone down. And I'm going to get to another clip in a bit here discussing again what Biden should, of course, won't do, but what needs to happen. Because you can make, you can pass all the laws in the world. It does not matter when you have an extremist right wing Supreme Court that does not give a shit about human rights, workers' rights, or the environment. So it doesn't really matter what you get done legislatively, as long as you have these extremists in the highest position of power an unelected position of power overturning anything that you do to actually help, whether it's workers, whether it's the environment, whether it's uh, human rights. So the Hill here with their summary, I'm going to read through, I might as well just read through the article because it's not too long and, um, you know, I'm doing this uh, last minute here, but, or not last minute, but as the story is breaking. So, as the Hill writes, the Supreme Court on Thursday curbed the Environmental Protection Agency's ability to regulate climate change, setting limits on how the agency can deal with power plants. And by the way, I will get to any chats, any super chats, random chats as well. I'll just pick up some uh, of your opinions as we go along here. But in a uh, six to three ruling, 
the justices determined that Congress did not authorize the EPA to induce a shift toward cleaner energy sources using the approach that an Obama air regulation sought to. Quote, Congress did not grant EPA the authority to devise emissions caps based on the generation shifting approach the agency took in the Clean Power Plan, the majority wrote. The ruling was spurred by an appeal to a decision last year that struck down a Trump-era power plant rule. In appealing that decision, West Virginia asked the court to consider whether the EPA has the authority to try to push the entire system away from coal and reshape the country's electric grid. The Obama administration tried to regulate power plants on a system-wide basis through a combination of both improvements to existing coal plants and a shift away from it toward renewables and natural gas. So I'm just going to stop here. Essentially, they said, hey, Obama said, let's listen to the people that know what they're talking about, the scientists. And, And even still, they're not listening to them or weren't listening to them to the degree that they should have been. But let's trust the EPA to understand what needs to be done on a, on a national level to deal with this. That's what they did. The court is saying, no, the people that have the power here are the uh, fossil fuel companies. Not So uh, essentially limiting the EPA's ability to have sort of these, these wide-ranging uh, big plans to address this issue in any serious way. Because, you know, going on a piecemeal basis, hoping that states do the right things, hope, hoping that these corporations do the right thing, it's not going to get you very far. This is why you need a national plan to deal with something like this, and ultimately a, you know, a, a global plan to deal with this. But at the very least, in your power as the government, a national plan to deal with this, and you that's why you have the EPA to deal with these sorts of issues on a national scale, but instead you have the court limiting its ability to deal with this in a way that they that they should be able to. In 2016, the Supreme Court put a temporary halt on that on Obama's regulation, blocking it from taking effect. It was eventually replaced by a Trump-era rule that only included efficiency improvements from coal plants and no shifts to other energy sources. The Obama rule was considered to be significantly better at mitigating climate change than the Trump rule, which it expect with it expected to cut 415 million short tons of carbon dioxide by 2030 compared to its successors, 11 million short tons. And legal experts recently told The Hill that preventing the agency from using certain climate tools could result in regulations that allow more planet warming emissions overall. The Biden administration is preparing its own power plant regulations and EPA Administrator Michael Reagan has said previously that it was waiting for the Supreme Court's decision before moving forward. We're going to be ready to go as soon as the Supreme Court rules, Reagan told Congress in April. Well, (laughs) what's that plan going to be now? This is becoming an issue now, not just, you know, within the borders of America, but this is a worldwide issue. If you don't have the EPA in a position to actually regulate clean air on a national level, that becomes a worldwide problem. You have here an extremist right-wing court that you can't get around unless you deal with the court itself, either by expanding it or by eliminating it entirely. So let me go to, um, once again, this is, so, Ali Mistal is somebody that I often reference because I find him both to be uh, incredibly knowledgeable, but also entertaining in the way that he's able to actually educate people on these issues. Here he is again on C-SPAN discussing, this is in regards to the row, uh, the overturning of Roe, but again, th- this, this opinion here about expanding the court, this applies to all of these issues. Uh, your thoughts on his response from Friday, uh, the response of this administration to this opinion? Yeah, so when Biden says, as he has said, that he will not um, uh, call for ending the filibuster or for expanding the Supreme Court, what he's saying is that he will do nothing. Because unless you eliminate the filibuster and codify Roe v. Wade as a federal law, and unless you expand the Supreme Court so that the justices who just overturned 50 years of precedent precedent, don't turn around and overturn an act of Congress before breakfast, which they will, then you get nothing. 
the conservative Supreme Court has proven itself. It has said that it does not care about past legal precedent. It does not care about rights unless white men gave you those rights in the 19th century. That's what the conservatives are doing right now. So either you accept that as Biden apparently is willing to and you get nothing or you do what's necessary to reform the court, to reform the Senate, to reform our politics so that rights can be protected. Yeah. So that is the situation that um, the entire country, and at this point, again, because this is a global issue, globally, this is the issue that we are facing right now, that you have this extremist right-wing court that you cannot get around. And think about, two, at least here, two seats were stolen. You had Obama's seat stolen, of course. The It was fine for the GOP to... Uh, restrict the sides of the court for a year as they held that seat open until Trump came in. So you have that seat stolen. Then they ran through Amy Coney Barrett at the end of um, uh, Trump's term in the last, the final weeks before Biden became president. You have here a court that even in the way that it's devised, the numbers should not be where they are if the rules were actually followed. Can you imagine if the shoe was on the other foot? Can you imagine any scenario where Democrats would have been able or would have even attempted to hold a Supreme Court seat open for an entire year under a Republican presidency? Or a scenario where they ran through a Supreme Court pick in the final days before an election? Can you imagine either scenario? This shows you how weak Democratic leadership is. So for them to sit back, have these seats stolen, do nothing about it, not expand it, not like there's no, Biden isn't even discussing any, any potential reforms to the Supreme Court. All he is today, all he has said is that now finally he's open to a car vote for the filibuster to, uh, to codify um, Roe into law, to, to have a abortion rights codified. Okay. What happens when the Supreme Court decides in a couple of years to to reverse that uh, assuming again massive assumption here that democrats are able to gain even more seats on this in the senate in the midterms have you know the majority of them minus i guess mansion actually support a filibuster carve out to uh, codify abortion rights imagine that magical world where that even happens okay they have now abortion rights now law you still have the issue of this extremist right-wing Supreme Court that can flip that at, at essentially any time, you know, once there's a, a, a challenge in place. And of course, there will be a challenge in place. So they can flip that. And now what? This is why you have to deal with the actual issue, which is the court. If you don't deal with that, it doesn't matter what the hell you do. As Congress, as the president, it doesn't matter what's in place in terms of any of these agencies, they will flip it for corporations. They will flip it for the right wing, um, uh, Christian, uh, white supremacy, uh, white supremacists. They will flip it in their favor, regardless of what you have in place in terms of law, in terms of these agencies, what they're, what they're actually uh, doing, because that is their ideology. They don't care. They will find whatever justification they need to do whatever they want, which is why you have to either eliminate the Supreme Court, or expand it, and or have some. You know, uh, Bernie had a, an idea in place when he was running about having um, essentially these rotating seats. So anybody that's on the Supreme Court wouldn't be there for long; they would be rotated out. As uh, I think, if I can find his actual wording, his basis for this was that there was there was nothing saying that the Supreme Court uh, that those that those seats need to be held by the same individuals, that they're simply, as long as they are part of the federal court system, then ultimately that's what matters. Let me uh, find this. Here we go. And then I'll get to a bit more on, on this ruling from NPR here. But so Bernie had a radical plan, <laughs> first of all. We gotta stop using this stupid ass terminology. 
radical is used ever notice how radical is only ever used when it's about doing something that will actually help people medicare for all radical uh codifying or, or expand the supreme court radical these radical plans codifying abortion rights radical like no radical <laughs> at this point just bernie sanders has a a uh, rational plan to fix the Supreme Court. That's what this this title should be. But if I can summarize this, I think there's one paragraph that summarizes it. So um, at the time, Bernie was not really open to uh, expanding the court because his... Let me see. So we had two more judges. The next guy comes in, maybe a, a Republican. Somebody comes in, you have two more. And before you know what he said, you have 87 members of the Supreme Court. And I think that delegitimizes the court. So basically his point being, and I, and I think this is stupid, honestly. I, I'm, a, of course, a massive Bernie supporter. You all know that. But the idea that you, you legislate based on what Republicans may do in the future, I think is a stupid way to go about things. Yes, they may expand the court even further. Okay, but how about for now, <laughs> expand it and do what you can with that expansion. But his point being, there must be more than just that. So he's not in support of expanding it, but, you know, I would still be in support of expanding it. But expanding it plus this idea would also be a good idea. So he suggested another alternative. It may be possible to rotate judges off the Supreme Court and onto lower courts. A federal judge has a lifetime appointment, Sanders told Rule. But the Constitution doesn't say that lifetime appointment has got to be on the Supreme Court. It's got to be on the federal court. So there you go. How about expanding and have rotating judges? I would be in support of that. And um, because yeah, people have to understand. Politics life is not a done deal. Nothing is ever set in stone. This is always a constant battle. So, you know, there were some people <laughs> coming at me and other people that were saying, what's the point of uh, of codifying abortion rights into law when, you know, the Supreme Court will just reverse it? But then you can make that argument for anything. Okay, why pass any law? <laughs> because the Supreme Court may reverse it. This is why you have to both pass the law and deal with the Supreme Court. And even then, that, you know, that that reform Supreme Court is not set in stone. It's going to be a constant battle to ensure that it is it is in a position that f best favors human rights, environmental justice, workers' rights, but understanding that there's always going to be a continued pushback towards that from largely capitalist interests and white supremacist interests. So there's always going to be, you know, that push and pull. But if you actually deliver for people show them what you can do while you are in power, then there is more, uh, the likelihood is greater that they will, that voters will actually be willing to support you because then they see, hey, they're in power, something's actually getting done. And they're asking for a little more support to do a little more, okay, fine, I will grant them that support because they've shown me that while they are in power, they are willing to use that power to support people, to help people, to help workers, to help the environment. And um, to ultimately, you know, do something. But if you don't do anything with the majorities that you have when you have them, and people saying, oh, but Joe Manchin, fine. How about at least trying to fight? If Manchin really is the issue, and it's not just Joe Biden being completely incompetent, which I think that's the, the actual issue. But if Manchin's the issue, why isn't Biden trying to at least publicly push Manchin, fight Manchin? Look what they did to Madison. Look what the GOP did to Madison Cawthorn. Look what Democrats do to progressives. They just, who just lost? Uh, Marie Newman, who I think won her seat two years ago. Someone who's more on the left, uh, more progressive. She defeated Dan Lipinski in that race a couple of years ago. Dan Lipinski was one of like the last two anti, uh, anti-abortion anti Democrats. She defeated him. The Democratic establishment came back two years later, and defeats Marie Newman. Look at how they fight progressives. You're telling me that they're, that Democrats, that Biden, Democratic leadership, can't fight their own members when it comes to conservative membership? When they clearly 
on a consistent basis fight progressives it's all just bullshit it's all just theater this is it is so this is why primaries when it comes to again there's a lot more than just voting activism plays a major part organizing um labor power plays a major part but when it comes to electoral politics when it comes to elections primaries are incredibly important you have to you have to uh if you are engaged enough to be following like a channel like this at the very least you have to be engaged in primaries and ensure that when it comes to your choices at the end of the year you're going to have someone that's actually you know worth uh worth your fight so let me grab i'll get more from npr here in a second because they add some more context to it but there's some chats here so Car wash freak says the solution adds seats we can't. Uh, the solution adds seats we can't to sit GOP gain. I, I'm not sure what you're saying, but <laughs> I'm trying to. The solution adds seats we can't to sit GOP gain. That's not really a sentence. Adding seats we can undo GOP destructive ruling. I know you're all trying to fit in your sentence in like a short. Um, cause you only have like so many characters. Unfortunately, I don't know what you're saying car wash freak, but I support, I I'm sure I support what you're saying because you often have good commentary, but, um, ultimately, yeah. I mean, if I can kind of read what you're saying, uh, adding seats is necessary. Even if the GOP may try and add more later on, you have to do what you can while you are expanding the court. And then again, as I said, it's a constant fight. Law Gnomes says, can we just confirm about seven new justices and form a queue to fill seats for when right-wing nuts finally retire or otherwise vacate their seat? Yeah, in a sane world where you have rational leaders in the Democratic Party, this would be a no-brainer, but not happening. Hauntus Farmer says, another $15 donation will fix this. <laughs> Sarcasm. The problem is activist, authoritarian judges. This should terrify all us Americans. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to... I can almost guarantee you, you're going to see even more emails go out now about, oh, rush, uh, rush $15 to the Democratic Party to, to elect more Democrats and save the environment. And then, you know, they have power right now. They have Congress. They have the White House. And anyone that goes, oh, but Manchin, okay, fine. Then can we at least see Biden try to fight Manchin? But he's not doing that. So don't give me this bullshit about, oh, Manchin, when there isn't even a fight going on to actually try and uh, push him in a direction that would pass Biden's own agenda. Like, think, think of how much of Biden's own agenda that Manchin and Cinema have blocked. And this weak-ass bitch hasn't done shit about it. Just the weakest Democratic president in, in modern time. Cyber Shaman says, heard a good idea today. Make it so that every president gets two appointments per term. That would keep the court fresh and more closely reflect the will of the people over time. Not a bad idea, but you'd have to start with the court being equal. Which you can't really do when it's, you know, a, a nine-seated court. So I'm not sure how that would start. <laughs> I guess. Because um, at this point, you know, Democrats should have two seats regardless because two were, were essentially stolen. You had Merrick Garland's seat stolen from Obama, and then you had Coney Barrett rammed in at the end of Trump's term. Democrats should have those two seats. Law Gnome says 13 justices each serving a 26-year term, two years between each replacement, pull from and return to the lower courts. Yeah, I mean, term limits, I think, term limits is a bare minimum. Expanding the court is a bare minimum. And all of this needs to be done now. And Biden is currently against any sort of reform to the Supreme Court. I mean, they, they have this trust in, the, in these institutions as if just the existence of the institution itself somehow going to work out for, for oh, it's all going to work out in the end. Is it? How? When you, especially when you have one side completely breaking the rules and they don't care, for you as the opposition party, not even, I've said this a, a bunch, but Democrats are the governing party. They are in power, but they are 
really the opposition. Does it feel like Democrats are in power right now? <laughs> this is, Republicans are in control. To have a Democratic Party that is so weak, unwilling to even use what power they have, let alone do what Republicans do and steal Supreme Court seats, for Democrats not even to follow the rules that exist for them to use the power they have when it comes to, they can expand the court now, nothing says they can't. For them not to do just the bare minimum in terms of protecting human rights, protecting the environment, uh, is it shows you again how weak the party is. Car Wash Freak says Biden needs to be primaried out in 2024. 100%. It is. It would be political malpractice for the Democratic Party to not primary Biden if he runs for a second term. I saw. I'm going to share this. I saw. I saw AOC tweet something out yesterday that appeared to maybe hint at something like this. Um, let me find this tweet. I thought I replied to it. I can't find it. Here we go. So uh, this was tweeted out yesterday. Biden is unlikely to take up the bold steps to protect women's rights to have an abortion that Democratic lawmakers have called for in recent days. And then, so she tweets this screenshot with this saying, White House aides say President Biden is irked by his party's persistent questions over his plans to seek re-election in 2024. It's like, yeah, <laughs> you wonder why people keep asking. It's because you ain't doing shit, bitch. Sit the fuck down. Retire, old man. Get out of the goddamn way. You ain't do... Imagine... Living your entire life, trying to be president. Biden's, what, run like three times? He finally won. And <laughs> to what? Just sit in the Oval Office? Like, what the fuck are you doing? To, to have this desire to be president your entire life, and you get there and don't do shit, it is incredible. It shows you how... And this isn't... I mean, it is kind of just him, because I'm thinking, no, other <laughs> other presidents have done things. But he, has, he hasn't done shit. I mean, he passed the American Rescue Plan at the beginning of the year, but that was, like, necessary. I mean, a lot of this is necessary. But uh, a lot of what is not getting done is necessary. But American Rescue Plan, you know, bare minimum shit. And what, that, that's your, your legacy? The American Rescue Plan? <laughs> like, come on, man. It is so embarrassing to have someone this, so, this incredibly weak. So many people get into politics just to have that label. To, oh, I want to be, I'm the president now. Look at me, I was the president. Like, that's it. Okay, what did you do? Did you help society? In any, did you push things forward in any way? Any way at all? Did, did you help people in any way? And it's it's really just, to, to have someone so weak and embarrassing like this in power as the head of the party, It no wonder he's getting asked about, is he going to run again? Because they don't want him to run. Even David Axelrod, who ran Obama's campaign twice, you know, a, a not a progressive guy, <laughs> Axelrod, even he's questioning Biden running a second term, saying that his age is a factor. Now, that's a kind way to put it. Ultimately, it, it isn't about, you know, it isn't about the number. It's about mentally, are you there? And also it's about what the hell are you doing? So Biden is, you know, a zero on both. Mentally not there. What is what is he doing? He ain't doing shit. There is when you even have people like David Axelrod coming out and saying maybe Biden shouldn't run a second term, then you know you've lost people. So uh, we will see. We will see if there's a challenge. If you know if Biden keeps going this way, and I'm sure he will. I doubt he's going to change. Then it would be political malpractice not to uh, not to challenge his power. I'll get to some more chats in a second here. I just want to give some more context on this EPA ruling as NPR adds here at issue in this case. So again, in case you're coming late to this, Supreme Court has sharply curtailed the authority of the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change in a six to three ruling. The court sides with conservative states and fossil fuel companies in adopting a narrow reading of the Clean Air Act, limiting the EPA's ability to sort of have these large projects on a national scale to actually deal 
with the climate crisis. So NPR adds here at issue in this case, in the case were rules adopted by the Trump and Obama administrations and aimed at addressing the country's single largest carbon emissions problem from coal fired power plants. The Obama plan, the, my lips are so dry. I can't even read. One sec. <clears throat> the Obama plan was broad. The Trump plan narrow. The Obama plan didn't regulate only coal fired plants. Instead, it set strict carbon limits for each state and encouraged the states to meet those limits by relying less on coal-fired power plants and more on alternative sources of energy, wind, solar, hydroelectric, and natural gas. The goal of the plan was to produce enough electricity to satisfy U.S. demand in a way that lowered greenhouse gas emissions. The concept worked so well that even after Obama's clean power plan, uh, plan was temporarily blocked by the Supreme Court and then repealed by the Trump administration, most utilities continue to abandon coal because it was just too expensive compared to other energy producing methods. In fact, even without the regulation in place, the reduction targets for carbon emissions were met 11 years ahead of schedule. This is the only, if you're going to find a silver lining here, and God damn, you got to look, you got to get the microscope out to find the silver lining. But it's that this shit, the, this shit's becoming so bad that it's actually beginning to become beneficial for these companies to move away uh, from coal. It's becoming a, 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 a benefit to capitalism to move away from fossil fuels. Now, of course, not beneficial to, you know, coal plants, but it is becoming beneficial to society uh, for these companies to move away from this garbage and move towards renewable energy. That is the only tiny silver lining that you got to find with the microscope but um so you know it's good to see that they were able to meet meet this 11 years ahead of schedule but uh not having these plans in place not having the ability for the epa to even discuss and you know introduce these new plans these new ideas this wouldn't have happened because you had to have the epa to begin with bring this up as a way to sort of uh kick the whole process so a bit more here, fearing the Obama approach might someday be revived. The coal industry joined by West Virginia and 16 other states went to court in support of the Trump plan and its more restrictive interpretation of the Clean Air Act. A federal appeals court in Washington, D.C. ruled against them in 2021. But on Thursday, the Supreme Court sided with the coal industry, ruling that the Clean Air Act does not authorize anything other than direct regulation of coal-fired plants. Writing for the court majority, Chief Justice John Roberts said that under what the court has recently called the major questions doctrine, neither the EPA nor any other agency may adopt rules that are transformational to the economy. So if you're going to deal with the climate crisis on, on a realistic, in a realistic, rational way, there has to be, it has to be a transformational process. It has to be a nationwide uh, approach. If you don't do that, then you're, you are not going to properly deal with this issue, and we're all going to burn on this planet alive. And unfortunately, that's the direction at this point that we are going. And it isn't just, to be fair, I guess, it isn't just uh, the U.S. It's, this is a, an issue globally, is we are not listening to what the scientists are saying about this and our approach as they have said, uh, needs to be a lot more, needs to be implemented quicker. It needs to be a lot more um, transformational. And we are not adopting what is necessary to actually deal with the climate crisis and uh, limit the warming of the planet. Now, unless Congress has specifically, so they're saying um, the EPA nor any other agency may adopt rules that are transformational to the economy unless Congress has specifically authorized such a transformative rule to address a specific problem like climate change. In his opinion, so again, not looking at what the science is saying, not listening to the experts on this issue or, or any issue that in regards to, um, you know, where, where science comes into play, but instead it has to be done specifically just legislatively by lawmakers who, of course, are pulled in the direction of where the money is, who's funding them, and, you know, at, at least one party completely bought, the other party majority purchased as well. So how can you possibly have a clear-headed approach legislatively here 
when you have a Congress that is purchased and you have scientists saying one thing and lawmakers acting in the opposite way. This is, again, showing you the need to uh, listen to the science. And you have here the Supreme Court essentially saying, no, only Congress can do what is necessary, regardless of what the science actually says. In his opinion, Roberts wrote, in quote, certain extraordinary cases, both separation of powers, principles, and a practical understanding of legislative intent make us reluctant to read into ambiguous statutory text. The delegation claimed to be lurking there. Uh, what else here is necessary? To convince us otherwise, something more than merely a plausible textual basis. Okay. Here we go. So the dissent here from Elena Kagan. Today, the court strips the EPA of the power Congress gave, gave it to respond to the most pressing environmental challenge of our time. It deprives EPA of the power needed and the power granted to curb the emission of greenhouse gases. She was joined by the court's two other liberals. The decision appears to enact major new limits on agency regulations across the economy, limits of a kind not imposed by the court for 75 years or more. The decision, for instance, casts a cloud of doubt over proposed Securities and Exchange Commission rule that would require companies offering securities to the public to disclose climate-related risks, like severe weather events that have or likely will affect their business models. Also in jeopardy is a new interim rule adopted by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission aimed at treating greenhouse gas emissions and their contribution to climate change the same as all other environmental impacts. This is... This is amazing. The decision was a particularly bad omen for environmentalists in a very... Re okay, this is stupid framing. No, this is a bad omen for literally the entire planet. But the idea that this is like, oh, some people are saying this, and environmentalists are really against this. Maybe people that live on the planet Earth, uh, maybe it's bad for them. In a re very real sense, it seemed to reject any holistic regulatory attempt to deal with climate change. Okay, a bit more here. What's more, the way the court dealt with the case is an indication of its new and very muscular approach to regulations in general. After all, when the case was initially before the court, for all practical purposes, there was no regulation in place. The Obama rule had been put on hold by the court, and then I already discussed this earlier. All right, I think I gave you enough context here. Um, so yeah, this sucks. Too long, didn't read. This this sucks. Let me get some more chats here. I am, I am sweating, which makes me fear I'm getting sick again. I don't know. I may have COVID. I don't know. I really don't want to have COVID. But it is what it is. Okay. Uh, I think I stopped at. Lawn Gnomes says five seats were stolen. Don't forget, Bush lost the election in two thousand. Also a good point. And, and again, imagine the roles were reversed and what would have happened in that election uh, if it had been, um, you know, Gore, not Bush. Eleanor, Eleanor, I can't pronounce your last name, but Eleanor says we already have term limits, elections. Term limits are a right-wing way to make sure effective left-wing legislators aren't there long. Just vote. Uh, okay, I don't agree with you. Like, look at look at who ha holds power right now. While Democrats are technically in power, it feels like Republicans are. You absolutely need... Forget left versus right. Forget right versus wrong. Term limits allow society to evolve with the times. You have people in there that have been there for not just the Supreme Court, but we're talking like the Senate, we're talking, um, uh, you know, Congress generally, that have been there for ages. And, you know, at the very least, at the very least, presidents, senators, um, representatives, they are elected. Supreme Court is not. So you have these nine unelected incredibly powerful people deciding 
you know, what environmental pr protection should include, what human rights should include, and they get to be there for the rest of their lives. That's regardless of anything. That's pretty effed up, in my opinion. Shane says, sometimes I just think that the planet was effed the moment we started pumping oil out of the ground. We will not be able to keep below 1.5 degrees. Lester Amos says, why is SCOTUS coming out with all these rulings all of a sudden? It's there. It's the, the time that they do this. Uh, rain, rain bows. And, and today was the last day, I believe. I don't think tomorrow... I don't think tomorrow's going to have anything else because uh, you finally have Katanji Brown Jackson now being sworn in. Um, Rainbow says, I think we need a Bernie slash Warren joint ticket in the 2024 primaries. At this point, I don't care which is president or VP. We need them in office yesterday. Somebody has to challenge Biden. It needs to be, you know, the entire slate. I don't even care, like ideology wise, have someone who's willing to fight Republicans. How about that at the very least? Have someone who's actually willing to use the power that they have. So there's, I've discussed this in other videos, but there has to be a robust primary challenge to, to legitimize the challenge. Because if you have just one person out there, let's say Nina Turner challenges Joe Biden. The press isn't going to cover it or even or take it seriously. But if you have sitting lawmakers, so you have Bernie Sanders, you have Elizabeth Warren, you have... Uh, John Fetterman, let's say he wins his Senate seat. You have, I don't know, Jamie Raskin, Katie Porter. You have like a large group of people all challenging Biden at once. Now, you know, at some point, narrow it down to one person that they all get behind. But start with a group of them. Make it serious. That then legitimizes the idea of challenging Joe Biden. Discuss what he isn't doing that he could be doing. And look, at the very least, let's say it's just not to, even though I actually think at this point it would be successful considering how unpopular Biden is and how clearly he's not using any of his powers. At the very least, it may push Joe Biden into action on an executive level. Because at that point, he would have already lost, you know, in the midterms. We'll have very little power if he loses the Senate. So at the very least, it may push him to actually do something when it comes to executive orders to try and combat this challenge from you know, the center, center left. So there is no, there is absolutely no downside at all to challenging Joe Biden uh, in a second term, because the man already said, didn't he already say he wasn't going to, uh, wasn't going to run or like that, that was the idea that was being put out there, that this was going to be a one term thing. I'm not sure if he actually publicly said that, but it was, that was either leaked or let me find this. Because that was the idea initially, that it's like, okay, this this guy can get can get Trump out because he was there before. People, you know, unfortunately, people trust him. Um, here we go. I knew I wasn't just dreaming this up. Biden signals to aides that he would serve only a single term. So this is 2019, I believe. Yeah. So that's. This was like part of the set. <laughs> the sales pitch for him was that all right he's the guy to get trump out that that's his only job here to get trump out people trust him enough because he was there before he's sort of uh you know this there's this familiarity that that some voters have because he was there before and they know they've known about him for so long he's the guy to get trump out and then once he's out then we replace him with someone that actually you know isn't a piece of garbage that was the idea and now he's you know once you, it's the thing with all these people it's the ego when you have the power you don't want to give it up it's not about what is best for people, best for society, best for the country. It's what's best for you and your own ego. You want to be able to run. You want to be able to say you had two terms. That's what he wants. But now clearly, um, I lost my train of thought here, but clearly he should be challenged to, to, to run again, which he's going to do. Um, he, he's not going to win. He, he likely is going to face DeSantis the way things are going. If you're looking at any polling, everything is moving in the direction of DeSantis. Trump, at this point, whether or not he, you know, <laughs> can you imagine if Trump gets thrown in jail? Be amazing. But <laughs> regardless of that happening, the party is moving towards DeSantis because they see someone who is essentially Trump minus the baggage. 
And in that sense, DeSantis, I think, is worse than Trump. He is smarter than Trump. He can get around uh, the media the way that Trump can. Trump is too outlandish, out there, brash. It's obvious. You know, all of his, uh, a lot of what he did, not all of it, but a lot of what he was doing was covered properly, uh, surprisingly, by a lot of the media because it was so overt and obvious and out there, and he's such a ridiculous person. When it comes to DeSantis, he's able to hide his moves enough and and couch it in language that isn't as uh, scary to at least, you know, the way that mainstream press covers things, that he's able to, to, to skirt around a lot of that criticism because of the way he operates. And without the baggage that Trump has, he, I think, is a lot more dangerous than uh, a second Trump term. But this is why you have to have someone who can actually challenge him in a way that shows they will actually do something. A second Biden term is not going to excite anybody. So the issue there isn't about, you know, like scaring off vote. Like this is the this is what this is what the corporate Democrats always try to put out there is oh, like this is what they what they're saying now about I have this in a different story. But I'm gonna bring it up for this story. Um Here we go. Biden and officials are concerned that more radical moves would be politically polarizing ahead of November's midterm elections, undermine public trust in institutions like the Supreme Court, as if you can undermine trust in the Supreme Court even further. It's at its lowest point in like history or lack strong legal footing, sources inside and outside the White House say. So people have to understand, because, you know, I'll often see, oh, Democratic leadership, they're in on it. They're, they don't want anything done. I mean, that's, yeah, they don't want anything done, clearly, because they're not doing anything. But it's not like, it's not like they're working with Republicans to not do anything. They, they are deeply... <laughs> they really have no goddamn idea how to do politics. So yes, a lot of them are bought by corporations, but on the issue of, of Roe v. Wade, abortion rights, this is not a, a corporate issue. So why would they be failing on this issue as well if it's simply about you know being controlled by the same money? That isn't the issue here. The issue is you have a party that doesn't, a, a leadership more specifically, that thinks this is how you win that thinks you win by doing nothing. This is insane, but this is how they operate. So you have to challenge this, this way of thinking. This is, how, this is how Democrats, this is how they do politics, and this is why they keep losing. The only reason, the only reason Biden won in 2020 was because Trump was a disaster on COVID. If COVID didn't happen, first of all, I, I don't think Biden would have become the nominee. Um, but regardless, if COVID didn't happen, you would not have Biden in the White House. But he was enough of a disaster that it, it made people want to switch uh, parties, and that's ultimately what led him to victory. I think at that point, any Democrat would have won against, pretty much any Democrat would have won against uh, Trump in 2020. But Biden was the familiar choice for a lot of people in the primary. That's why he became the nominee. That's why he ultimately won. But this doesn't work a second term. With Trump out, that fear no, is no longer there. You now have DeSantis who, uh, peop, you have Rogan now. Joe Rogan coming out to endorse Ron DeSantis. You have to have an actual challenge to uh, to their garbage. Because if you don't, you are giving up the presidency and ultimately the entire country to far right-wing Christian uh, white nationalism. All right. There's some more chats here. Let me get these. Donald James says, nice surprise, David. Didn't expect you on. That's right. Thank you, Donald. Um, yeah, as I, as I said earlier, I began to feel... So I was sick yesterday. That's why, that's why there's no video. I began to sick 
sick. I began to feel a little sick this morning as I was prepping a different video. And then this story broke, so I wanted to make sure I covered this before I, if I actually became sick. But um, like, if you can tell, I'm sweating now. And there's no reason I should be sweating. I finally got air conditioning. Finally. So it's supposed to be cool in this room. <laughs> and I'm like sweating my ass off. I, I might have COVID, but I don't no, and I haven't got tested, so I I don't really go anywhere. But uh, whatever, I'll be fine. Eleanor says Republicans started term limits because progressive FDR was in too long for them and ensures effective progressives leave soon. Just vote. I, I already saw. Okay, telling people to just vote. The issue. The issue is not the people in this chat. The issue are the 40% of people who don't normally vote, who are not watching the Rational National. 40% of people that Democrats have to reach out to. The way you, that's how Democrats win, reaching out to people that don't normally vote. When voting turnout is high, Democrats win. The way you appeal to, the, to that non-voting public is by actually showing people that when you're in power, you can accomplish something. You can actually change their lives for the better. If you can't do that, if they feel no real difference, as it feels right now, it doesn't feel like Democrats are in power, unless you, you know, unless you follow this shit and expect nothing from Democrats. But if you're someone who like, is this, has this last year or so really been different from Trump? Really? You know, maybe on a, in terms of a, a cultural impact, in terms of, you know, the, the garbage Trump said on, on a daily basis, yes, there, there's a difference there. But in terms of, you know, legislatively, what's really changed? So this is this is the issue here. You have to you have to put the pressure on the people in power. Yelling at people to vote does not make them vote. If that if the, if it did, then I would do more of that. But it doesn't. So why would I focus on yelling at people to vote when the people that are involved in this shit largely vote anyways? The people that follow this largely vote anyways. I'm sure some of you don't, but largely they do. The people that don't normally vote are the ones that are not engaged. To engage them, you have to actually do something for them. That's the bottom line. Saying just vote is not a solution. Mr. Rabbit says, honestly, I wish Poison Ivy was real so she can ch choke the effing extreme court. <laughs> they deserve no mercy. Um, Law Gnome says, hard disagree on term limits. Once they're out, they got scooped up by a corporation who then will have more knowledge on how lawmaking works than the continually fresh lawmakers. Uh, Environmental Coffeehouse says, maybe Guy McPherson is right. Uh. Uh, Mushroom says, don't know what to say, just wanted to donate. Thank you, Mushroom. Nurse Betty says, now that Elon Musk, quote, turned Republican, they're now buying Teslas, which may be reverse psychology. <laughs> LOL, not a solution, but a start. Uh. I don't think electric cars are, are the solution to, to the climate crisis. Um, but I hear what you're saying. Bernie, the Kiwi Dragon, says, are those Captain Planet villains sitting on the SCOTUS bench watching anxiously from the UK? Captain Planet, that takes me back. Definitely uh, was a big fan of Captain Planet. Scaro says, I'm pretty sure, and very generous donation, thank you says, I'm pretty sure they want to lose the midterms as they will ensure they can go back to the easy mantra of blaming the Republicans without actually having to worry about accomplishing anything. I'm sure some of them feel that way. Uh, a lot of them just, they just want, you know, an easy job, sit back on their ass, don't do shit, collect uh, checks from corporations for their re-elections, and, you know, have their insider trading. There's definitely a lot of that going on. Nurse Betty says, it's ridiculous that we constantly have to pick from the best of two evils. I agree. Literal Lil says, it's my birthday today and I made it to stream. It's my lucky day. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Nurse Betty um, says, I think Warnock should run in 2024. Thoughts? Yeah. I, I actually do think uh, Warnock's pretty good. Um, but again, he'd have to be, this is, this is the issue with the primary uh, idea of primarying Biden, they have to be willing to challenge established democratic power. And so far, even Bernie isn't willing to do that. Bernie has said he's not going to, at least from what's being leaked out 
from the idea that he may run again in 2024. He ha- he's been saying that he's not going to challenge Biden if Biden runs a second term. That, to me, as I said earlier, is political malpractice. You have to challenge Biden because Biden will 100% lose. For sure, he will lose, especially if it's a matchup with DeSantis. So you have to, if you want to, I don't know, save society, you have to challenge Biden. At the very least, it would maybe make him into a good candidate. Maybe make him actually do something with his power. Um, But at best, you would actually replace him on the ticket and have someone that is worth voting for up there on the Democratic side. Operating Rain says, we thought Bill Maher was bad for going Bernie to Klobuchar. (laughs) Rogan just topped him going Bernie to DeSantis. No core beliefs at all. Elite gonna elite. Maher also said recently that he thinks DeSantis is not as bad as Trump. He said that while um, uh, Crystal Ball was on. I disagree. I think I think DeSantis is worse because DeSantis, as I said earlier, operates you know under the radar in a way that Trump can't. DVDV says, make a poll to see if your chat votes or not. There is no polls anymore. They took that away. I don't I, like. <laughs> I don't know why YouTube or any of these um, platforms they take away their best features. Like Twitter took away its Instagram Story kind of feature, which I actually used. And I thought it was fine. I don't know why they took that away, but YouTube took away polls. So unfortunately, oh, well, I, in live streams, I can't pull. I could do a poll on community. Maybe there I will do a poll. Car Wash Freak says, if only we can abolish the SCOTUS, uh, it a clown. It's a clown, A-N-W, anyways. Travis Francis says, we need to move on from Bernie. He'll be 82 in 2024. It's not, but does it seem like he's 82? Go go watch my video, Bernie versus Lindsey Graham. That debate on Fox News happened like three weeks ago. Bernie was even stronger than he was in 2020. So look, I, I get it from a, 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 you know, general media perspective, how people look at numbers like 82 and think, oh, that guy's too old. Bernie's only a little older than, than Biden. <laughs> like, is there really a difference there? Bernie clearly is a lot more in it. He is a lot more aware and not even a lot. There's nothing wrong at all with Bernie's brain. He's the same guy mentally as he was in, in 2016, as he was, you know, 10 years earlier. He, he has not, his brain has not, you know, disintegrated the way that Biden's has. So age is really just a number. It all depends on who the person is. But I do understand from a politics view of it that, yes, it's definitely tougher, a tougher sell to the press, to even voters, uh, to elect someone that is 82. I completely get it. But based on, like, what are your options? <laughs> that's, that's kind of, that's what it comes down to. What are your options? If there are better options, okay, then fine. If you if you can have the exact Bernie package, someone that you can trust, who has a history of being consistent, who uh, has principles, who stands up against established power, who doesn't back down, then fine, have that person. But even someone like Fetterman, who I I, I think Fetterman's great. I hope he becomes the senator in uh, Pennsylvania against Oz. But Fetterman, look up Fetterman in Israel. Look up his interview that he had. I forget. I forget who it was. I think it was, I forget which outlet it was, but it it was a Jewish outlet. And (laughs) goddamn, the interview is atrocious. His position there is terrible. Now that he may just be doing this now because it is a very new position for him. He's never had any position before when it came to um, the far right-wing Israeli government. But so he may be trying to avoid all the money being spent against him as it's being spent in other races. So he doesn't want to get involved in that where you have... uh, you know, the lobby just pouring billions in to destroy you. But regardless, his position is garbage. So I, I have not seen anybody that is as consistent, as principled as Bernie is on the issues. But if you have a replacement, cool. 
Katie Porter, uh, Katie Porter's great. What's her position on Israel? <laughs> I would like to know. I probably isn't the same. So the only person I can really maybe see as a true successor is someone like Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar. And I don't know if on a national level that they would be able to win right now with uh, with how things are. But I hope they could. That would be a, you know, a, I think a, a worthwhile uh, investment in terms of who the party should look to in the future. But I, I don't know if, 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 you know, considering their seat, their, their representatives, they aren't, you know, a senator. Um, I don't know. Steve says, tell the non-voters to write in abstain when all they get is shit candidates. They can then vote on the issues they believe in or have time to research. Especially if there's like ballot initiatives, like ballot initiatives or even just representatives that uh, or uh, like local seats that you want to vote for. Regardless, I think you should always vote. That's my that's always been my position. Um, I'm not saying it's a solution, but voting is a it's a tool. It's one of the few tools that you have in a democracy and your democracy is quickly becoming uh, a lot less democratic. Guy man, bro, dude, <laughs> it's a great name, says, can the 25th Amendment be used against Biden considering his lack of any action against the fascist takeover? He's demonstrating he's unfit for office. Look, if I was there, 100 percent. Again, if, if there were rational actors around Biden understanding how serious the situation is right now for the country, understanding what is necessary to turn things around. I completely think that that it would be definitely warranted to use. Um, of course, it was warranted against Trump, you know, from day one. But no doubt it's warranted against Joe Biden, for sure. But you're not going to have people around him use that. There's just no way. Andre Alexander says Bernie wouldn't even attack Biden on his clear weaknesses, and Warren was too busy attacking Bernie with fake allegations. Yeah, unfortunately that... Uh, God, there's so much... There's a lot of blame to go around, especially in that primary. I think if Warren, if Warren never ran, or if Warren backed Bernie from the start, it would have been clear that I think Bernie would have taken that uh, uh, that primary uh, with ease. But I think she was trying to get close to Biden, trying to become the VP again, focusing more on her potential power as opposed to what is actually best for society, and uh, that was both the downfall of the Democratic Party, the downfall of the country, and the downfall of her. Like, what did Warren get out of that? Nothing. She did all that garbage for nothing. And, and, and she lost a lot of support because of it, and a, a lot of trust because of it. And when it comes to Bernie being weak against Biden, yeah, for sure, he was. He could have attacked him a lot more, and I think, I think that was Bernie's weakness, is... Bernie likes Biden as, as, a, as an individual, as a person, not as a lawmaker. He's, he has criticized Biden and his, uh, more recently, about him being um, unwilling to do what he can with his power. But during a primary, he went after Hillary Clinton a lot harder than he went after Joe Biden. And that is very unfortunate. <coughs> Guy Man Bro Dude says, it's sad because the leftists and sock dems are very capable of criticizing their party while Republicans sit back and watch as Nazis take control. That's because that's what the party is. Their party, that's what, that's what that party is. Their base are white supremacists. I mean, the, <laughs> like it, something like 95% of, of Republican voters are white. So, you know, that's the party. So, you know, when anyone talks about don't play identity politics, identity politics, the Republican Party is the white identity party. 
they are the, the definition of identity politics. That's all they're about. But the, again, it's this is it's always projection for them. W whatever they are is what they accuse the others of being, and that is a, another example of that. Shiny turd versus normal turd. They're both crap, but one is nicer than the other, I guess. <laughs> That's from Naruto. Okay. Um, I do want to shoot another video that I had prepped earlier. And then another video. Uh, probably for tomorrow. Because guess what? Tomorrow is Canada Day. Meaning it's a holiday. So um, I don't think I'm working tomorrow. But I'm going to try and shoot some stuff for tomorrow and maybe the weekend. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. So I'll grab some last minute chats. Mike H., thank you for your super chat. Oh, my God. I, if you're not Canadian, you don't know what the hell's been going on. Every time you see a flag now, a Canadian flag on a truck, usually a pickup truck. <laughs> That person's a white nationalist. So I saw one of those today. They had like two massive Canadian flags and a F Trudeau sign. And it's like, Jesus Christ. They have ruined. They have. Uh... Then again, if we really get to the history of Canada, there really is not a whole lot to celebrate. But you really, it's 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 become the symbol now for white nationalists in Canada. And, uh, and it's uh, a wild thing to see. Mike H. says, in positive news, the right lost Dave Portnoy. I wonder how many Dave Portnoys there are. So, by the way, I was the first of that story. I'm just going to say, just going to say, where's my credit? Uh, I covered that like two months ago, like in March, when the when the leak first came out. Because that's when Dave Portnoy first came out and said, um, who, by the way, I had no idea who this guy was. <laughs> but I, I saw somebody tweeted the video and like, oh, this guy voted for Trump. He's, uh, he runs like some sports website, um, and now he's saying he can't vote for the GOP anymore because of the issue of, of abortion rights. So I covered that well back when he first talked about this. But uh, then he came out again after the actual overturning of Roe to say that he, you know, he hates both parties, but he's going to vote for Democrats because they're taking rights away, because the GOP are taking rights away. And yeah. I mean, I wonder how many of those people exist, really. So, you know, maybe the midterms will be a, a sign of that. How many Republican to Democratic voters there are. But I don't know. I tend to think there aren't too many of those people. But I could be wrong. Uh, the Spinner of Yarns says, can you adopt me? I cannot. But I do appreciate the $2. Thank you. Nurse Betty says, my daughter graduated from Queen's University last week. So I want to say congrats to her. Wow, congrats to Nurse Betty's daughter. Very cool. Andre Alexander says, LOL, what if Trump moved to Canada and ran? <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, what if he won? That would be hilarious to watch. Y'all freak out. So we don't have presidents here, right? Like, to be the prime minister, you have to be a sitting MP. So he would have to be a sitting MP first. He'd have to be the leader of his party. And then he would have to win. A lot of hoops there to jump through. We already we already have our, our own version that's worse in Pierre Polyev. So, again, um, there's plenty of Trump-like figures to go around that don't have all the overt wackiness that comes with Donald Trump. Chuck Atkins says, we've seen with redistricting how the GOP's decades of gerrymandering and state and federal judge packing lets them nullify even ballot initiatives and state constitution changes that threaten them. 100%. I think the Democrats' uh, lack of focus on, on, uh, on the courts and on voting rights up to this point has become very apparent. And ultimately, that is why, or that is what is handicapping them largely, is our judges and the gerrymandering. And this is like you, when you have, there hasn't been, 
I think more than two Republican presidents that have won the popular vote since like the 1970s. I, I think George Bush's second term, I think he won the popular vote then. But before that, it was like, who was it? I, I forget who it was, but we were talking like 1970s or like maybe, maybe even earlier where there was um, a popular uh, vote Republican. Well, I, actually, maybe Reagan. Reagan must have won popular vote, right? But man... Um, and, and even apart from that, the Senate, millions more, millions more have voted for Democratic senators than Republican senators, yet it's a 50-50 Senate. That's because you have states like Wyoming or like Idaho or like Kentucky. <laughs> and then you have California with the population of Canada. You have New York like massive states and tiny little states with, with no one living in them, all represented by two senators each. It seems like uh, kind of a ridiculous, undemocratic process. But that's how shit works. There's a lot of reforming that needs to be done, whether it's the court, whether it's the Senate, maybe just eliminate the Senate. Mike H. says Reagan two times and Bush Sr. won the popular vote too. Well, there you go. I keep forgetting, like, 30 years ago is not like 1970. 30 years ago is like the 90s. <laughs> I feel like, I don't know, as someone who grew up in the 90s and 2000s, it... It feels like, you know, last decade was the 90s. No, that that was not last decade. That was decades ago. Um, just bizarre. Like, people are turning 18 now who were born after 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild to me. Wild how fast time flies. All right. Oh, my God. Do you like Charles Booker? I do. In fact, Charles Booker came out today or yesterday. Let me find this, because I was going to use this too. Um, saying this. Hold up. I saved this for a different video, but here we go. So this is in response to President Biden is poised to... Oh yeah, I didn't even mention this. Jesus Christ. President Biden is poised to nominate an anti-abortion Republican attorney for federal judgeship in Kentucky. An apparent deal with Mitch McConnell. So they have this little deal going on where I guess Mitch McConnell is not going to... Again, making any deal with Mitch McConnell and thinking he's going to you know, follow through is, is to me insane. But they have this little deal going on where uh, Mitch McConnell's not going to block any of, any of the judges that Biden puts up, is what it sounds like this is. And uh, as long as Biden you know, nominates this anti-abortion Republican attorney... Like... <laughs> We're talking the same effing week that Rose overturned. This is what he's doing. So Charles Booker comes out, says the president is making a deal with the devil. And once again, the people of Kentucky are crushed in the process. At a time when we are fighting to protect human rights, this is a complete slap in the face. This is some bullshit. So in case you don't know, Charles Booker is running against Rand Paul in the fall. Charles Booker versus Rand Paul. Um, of course, it's Kentucky. Let's not pretend he has a good shot here. He doesn't. It's Kentucky. But this is the these are the kind of people you need. People that are willing to challenge power. And it's good to uh, notice how notice how much little attention Charles Booker has received compared to McGrath when McGrath was going up against uh, McConnell. 
I guess what, that was two years ago. So, so you had Booker and McGrath in a primary back then to go up against McConnell. All, all the money, or I should say that the Democratic Party, Schumer, came out to support McGrath. McGrath, like basically, a, you know, sort of a centrist at best, but more right wing, more, more conservative Democrat. Uh, of course, again, did not excite anybody to come out and vote. She lost, of course, against McConnell. But McGrath got so much more attention in that race. Here you have Booker. Booker won the nomination. Largely unopposed this time, I think. Like, this time the Democratic Party was like, we're not even going to bother. <laughs> we, we, we lost with McGrath last time. wasn't even close. So they sort of just, like, let Booker have this one. And very little attention. Again, showing you how the media and these established powers work together to form these narratives to push certain candidates out there. Booker barely getting any attention, despite the fact that he's going up against Rand Paul in Kentucky. This is a Senate seat. I know, very little hope. But look, McGrath had very little chance, and they covered her heavily. So it's what else is some bullshit is the way that Booker is not being covered. But uh, to have you know Booker out here calling bullshit on what Biden is doing or not doing is uh is good to see uh i your name is fuck you okay uh fu says really worried about a civil war too honestly if they pass a nationwide abortion ban how will they enforce it how do they enforce any law you know with the uh, with their state powers, with the police. Like, that's ultimately what would happen. Like, this is... People have to understand, and I'm sure most of you get this already, but outlawing abortion doesn't eliminate abortion. It just increases unsafe abortions. Meaning, increased death, uh, or more women dying essentially, is what it means. You don't outlaw abortion. It will continue happening in more unsafe ways. And you're also going to have people that are forced. I saw a post today. Someone is now forced to carry an unviable life within them. I think she's like 23 weeks pregnant. The the baby's, the, not the baby, the, the, the fetus is having seizures inside of her. It's, it's not going, it's not going to live. It's going to die. But this fetus has to continue living inside of her because she now cannot get an abortion. So until the thing actually dies inside of her, she can't get it removed. She has to carry this unviable life because of what just happened. So it, it's abortion is simply a medical procedure. That's that's what it is. And different religions and people that aren't religious have different views on, on when life actually begins. Uh, but, you know, the, the I guess the the halfway point or the, the, the agreement around Roe was that, hey, when is life viable? When is that life inside you? When is that, when can that live outside the womb? At that point, it should not be able to be aborted. That was sort of the compromise there. And now with that gone, it's, it's just like, a woman has no rights as as soon as she is, is impregnated. Has absolutely no rights. <clears throat> Free Sandlin says, I was born eight years after 9-11 and I'm 27. What? <laughs> that, that, that doesn't make any sense. I'm lost. All right. <clears throat> I have lost my voice. So I must save it to record at least two more videos today. Oh, last chat coming in here late. Darren says, this pisses me off. There are many ways to reduce abortions that can be implemented, like increasing minimum wage, Medicare for all, teaching sex ed properly, etc. But that's not what Republicans want. They want cheap labor and the oppression of the populace. Yes, you are 100%. Yeah, all of this, of course, everything you said is right. Also, anyone that's trying to, this, the, the whole argument is just, it's so frustrating because it is so goddamn stupid. It is so, it is obvious that Republicans do not care about life because once a life actually 
exists outside of a woman's body, they don't give a fuck about it. When it comes to healthcare costs, healthcare generally, when it comes to education, when it comes to clean air, the environment, the climate crisis, the world they're going to be living in, they, workers' rights, they don't give a shit about actual human beings that are not born into wealth. They don't care about the average person. And that is obvious from everything they do. So any argument to care about life is so completely insane that it amazes me that anybody can be fooled by that on its face. You have to be incredibly effing stupid to be fooled by the idea that Republicans care about life. It is so, it's, it is such a joke. Yet they still use the same bullshit arguments again and again. Okay. I gotta go. <clears throat> Thank you all for uh, showing up for this terrible story, unfortunately. But uh, I gotta maybe eat some lunch. Hopefully I stop sweating and uh, shoot some more videos and y'all have a good day. All right. Don't worry. Stay engaged. Stay involved. Things can get better. They can. I know it seems hopeless. Things can get better, but only if people like you stay engaged in the process, understand your power, use power where necessary, organize with others. Labor rights, a very important piece of this equation. And that is one actual silver line that, that is beginning to grow, is you're seeing more and more unions form, especially when it comes to massive corporations. That is incredibly important to move the conversation forward and gain power. That is how the people can win. It's a fight. It's a battle. It's a constant battle. It's always a constant battle. Even when you win on issues, it doesn't mean that issue is solidified. That's life. That's politics. It's a constant fight. So don't give up uh, completely, even though it is very easy to give up. Understand that there is a way to deal with the shit. And there are people in positions of power that want to actually do the right thing, but are currently hampered by the ones at the top of these institutions. But that the people at the top don't last forever. Pelosi, you know, Biden, Schumer aren't going to be there forever. They're going to be gone at some point. And in terms of so in terms of electoral politics, there is a future there. But there's also, of course, a future when it comes to your rights uh, in terms of, you know, society and the populace and where your power can be used. All right. Have a good weekend. Have a good day. See you all later. Goodbye.